Um, this is our last teaching session for this module. Kelly is going to be taking lesson 25. I'm going to be taking lesson 26. This is our last things, concluding things, tying, tying everything together finally. Um, um, as, we, as we wrap things up with this, uh, our part of this tonight, think through the lessons between now and next week that you think are the most significant, right? So if we have um, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So if we have eleven people next week, right? Think of what the ten or eleven key lessons probably are for this. That that I would say, okay. These are the lessons we're going to choose from. Somebody is going to teach these each of these lessons this evening. And remember, we're not teaching it the way Kelly and I have, but just giving an introductory overview of the lesson as you're preparing your counselee or your small group or whatever to, to face that lesson in the week ahead. Okay, So you're not gonna be teaching all of it. It's important for you to be able to grasp the key points. Um, but as we head into the, the, the last part, the last uh, teaching night for us, any questions that you have on, on these last two lessons, because these tie it all together, um, don't leave tonight without asking them, okay? Um, if any questions have come up while you've been reviewing things for up to this point, we're gonna try and leave enough time of cushion at the end to be able to get to those, because these are two very simple lessons, right? Um, anyway, I'm going to turn this over to Kelly. She's going to take, she's going to talk about the, um, the, the conclusion, the last things and take us into lesson 25. So Kelly, it's all yours. So congratulations. Here we are at the end, right? Of our unbound journey to freedom. Are you guys excited to be taking a break? <laughs> Good. Um, so what we know about lesson 25 and 26 is very much what Warren said. This is, this is really the bow that we put on the whole package, right? I think as we think through lesson 25 and 26 and we think about um, times in our life that um, we have been given things that we feel like we don't deserve, sometimes getting to these two lessons is... Um, quite a feat for people and you will see quite a bit of struggle and uh, this is definitely a participatory conversation tonight on these two lessons really crucial um, so I'll talk through lesson 25 and I'm going to stop in a couple points intentionally for some conversation so uh, don't check out and um, so as we know on the last things and uh, is that having a poor self-image as we've talked about all through Unbound comes from not seeing ourselves the way that God sees us, which is really who we are. We've been working week after week to reconcile who God says that we are, to get rid of the lies, to get rid of the junk that the world has put on us, right? We know that this poor self-image creates deep and lasting doubt, robbing us of confidence, Confidence in our worth, our value, and our potential to become what God has created us to be. What a wonderful place to get to this juncture and say, God, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do, right? Help me to see it and to trust that the thing that he's put in front of you is the thing that he's put in front of you, right? Our confidence in God's view of us is a must if we're to build a healthy self-image and have a God-centered confidence, right? The calm, confident assurance that we've been pursuing. And hopefully out of a place of um, a little more of a deeper degree of that transforming work that God has been doing in you all along or in the persons that we've been walking alongside, right? 
So we're not referring to self-confidence as we know, but rather confidence that God loves us and places great value on us individually as a person. Confidence that he will bring about the full completion of what he has begun in us, which he talks about in Philippians 1, 6, right? Confidence that he will enable us to be successful as long as we work with him. And that we will only find satisfaction and fulfillment in life as we become familiar with and practice his principles for success. So as we talk, uh, head into lesson 25, um, this is one of the passages that has been become near and dear to my heart. I won't go into too much detail about all of the nitty gritty parts of that, but Trusting that God has given us a gift, that he doesn't require anything from us, is a struggle for a lot of people. And if you have never, uh, if you were raised in an environment where gifts were rare, where basic needs uh, of human survival and care uh, wasn't provided, trusting gifts is a huge challenge for someone. So when James talks about every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change, because God is consistent. By his sovereign plan, he gave us new birth through the message of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of all he created. What a powerful and empowering message right and we know that's on the backdrop of everything else that James is talking to us about being faithful right to to rejoice in our struggle right so James is in agreement with us that this is a great place to wrap up our bow so let's talk about lesson 25 understanding self-sabotage We've all seen it in our lives, getting to the place where things are going well, and then we do something that demolishes the progress that we've made, right? We're super disciplined for a while, and for a while, our minds are clearer, our behaviors are less selfish, and our relationships are healthier. We're doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves sliding back into old patterns of thinking, feeling, and believing. We dabble in our old ways of behaving and surrender to old ways, ways of pouring, poorly treating ourselves and others, right? The, ga- the ground that we gain is lost, right? And so the toxic shame starts to build back up. We can't seem to hold on to the ground that we've taken back from the enemy. We started wrapping ourselves again in the decay-ridden grave clothes that God has been unbinding us from all this time. It's as if we've joined the opposing side of this battle, becoming allies with our own enemy and are working against God's best for our lives. And we start to engage in self-sabotage. Why is that? We know that there's four main culprits. One, I'm no good. And these are all based on the lies that we believe, right? The first one is, I'm no good. I don't deserve this better life that Christ is offering me. So think about that. I'm no good. What have we learned all along the way in Unbound, right? We start in lesson one talking about the worthy message, right? God says that he intended that our life would be good right? He was he's provided us with a life that he intended would be our way, right? So we know that that's a lie because it's counter to what God has been telling us all along. The second thing is that, uh, second lie that stands out is I haven't earned the good that I'm receiving and it isn't right for me to accept this. Why isn't it right? What starts to go on in our minds in that, right? There's doubt in that, right? It can't be, it's too good too good to be true, right? I know how to live the old life. I don't have any idea how to live this new one, right? And I'm going to go going to blow it sooner or later. I may as well just get it over with. So up to this juncture, what are some of the thoughts that you interacted with in these particular lies? 
Any of them resonate with you specifically? Or what's the number one that you can connect with? I would probably say number four. Uh, I'm going to blow it sooner or later. Uh, there, there was a season where I could just resonate with that. And it was like, uh, kind of like, well, like a little kid's railroad track. It would just go around in a circle and a circle and a circle. And it's like, why bother? I'm going to wind up back in the same place again anyway. And uh, so... Mm -hmm. As soon as, as soon as you read that, I thought, yeah, I can really connect to that. Yeah. Who else? What are, what are the ones that stand out for you as we read through that list? For me, it's the second one. I think that the struggle for me a lot of times has been focusing on the doing as opposed to the being. So that's my first like mindset to default to is what am I doing? Is it enough? It's not enough. And so that that's an easy one for me to fall into. Yeah. Yeah. The good old works, right? Number three for me stuck out. I think just like it's easy to live the way you've been living and that comes more natural and it's less scary and um, than doing something new. So that one stuck yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite, unfavorite word picture that Warren uses in that is, is like a baby being in its stinky diaper, right? And any mom or anybody that's ever changed the diaper knows how much the child hates, most of them hate having it changed, but we know it's what's good for them, right? To leave them hanging out in that isn't good. Um, it's kind of gross. <laughs> and so that I always- got it broke in. It finally fits. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good. So as we start to unpack the lies, we're gonna look at these one at a time. Once we identify the convoluted, Sandra, did you have something to say? Yeah. I was re-muting, but I was, I had un unmuted so I could say that, yeah, I was um, number three. It's, I feel like it's a horse heading toward the barn. You know, like it, it's just those ruts are so well worn. It's so easy when things get a little weird in life to just go back to the old patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well grooved road. Yeah. Yeah. So once we identify the convoluted reasoning, we take those thoughts captive as we've talked about, right? We've, we've given lots of tools up to this point of how do we take our thoughts captive, right? We know that what we focus on is what we're saturating on. What we're saturating on is what we believe and what we believe is what we live, right? This is where that really becomes more applicable, more of a place of God being able to do some deeper transformation in our lives. We've talked about the RMC, right? Um, we take our thoughts captive by knowing what our triggers are right? What gets us into those patterns of destruction, right? We've got some tools now. So to be here at this juncture, we should have a pretty good idea of what the lies are that entrap us pretty consistently. So let's look at reason one a little more in depth. I'm no good. I don't deserve this better life Christ is offering me. Yeah, none of us do, right? But God wants us in his kingdom, right, for his work that he has planned for us, right? And we know that the culprit is a poor self-image. And what we've learned up to this point is that self-image is rooted in what the world thinks of us, what we think of ourselves, right? And when we don't see ourselves as God sees us, the image that we have is defective and all we see are the flaws, Remember what we learned in lesson four when we're talking about the avatar, right? We either think so highly of ourselves or so lowly of ourselves, right? So we have to develop the attitude that we are complete and we are good enough in him. We're declared righteous, in fact, right? Romans 5, 1 and 2 speaks really specifically to that. We're fully worthy of his best because that is how he created us. 
and Satan would steal from us our joy, our peace, our confidence, and our hope, but we don't have to cooperate with him, and we surely don't have to let him have the victory, right? Um, I don't know if it was Warren or Chelsea that posted um, a little meme this weekend. It was pretty cool. It, it was talking about the things that God says that are affirming, that are truths, right? And on the other column uh, was it were things that um, Satan says, right? And so it really brings that passage in 2 Timothy 1.7 into full view, right? God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? But of love and power and a sound mind. So that's that's a, a pretty good um, uh, direction if you if you um, think about it. If if we're having a place where we're not feeling sound of mind and we're feeling fearful and we're feeling powerless, and that's how we're feeling, where's that coming from? It's not coming from God because that's not who He made us to be, right? Let me, so reason. Let me let me talk about the self image thing a minute. Because one of the conversations that's going on in the biblical counseling world a lot the last year and a half or so, two years, is now they're trying to get rid of the phrase self-image. The self-image is an apt descriptor because it's it's the image that we have of ourself, right? So everyone has a view of themselves. The question is, is it is that view of the view I have of myself, is it grounded in what God has declared? Or is it grounded in what the world declares? What value system am I using to develop or, or have I used to develop this image of myself? So don't let anybody rob you of the use of that language because it's, it's very accurate language. So what they end up doing is they try to redefine the, the, the term and make it something that it's not. Don't let them get away with that. This is one of the battles that I find um, everywhere, but sadly, even in the biblical counseling world now, where because um, people misunderstand what it means, self-image and self-esteem are completely different things, right? Because self-esteem is how do I esteem myself, right? It's not what, what is my understanding of who I am? That's self-image. Self-esteem is completely different. Self-esteem smacks of self-exaltation, self right? Yeah, and to say that we have no image of ourselves, that's, that's not accurate. That's not what God's asking of us, right? He well, and the argument is, well, we're creating the image of God, right? Okay, but if I don't understand that, okay, if I understand that, the image I have myself is going to reflect that truth. But if I don't understand that, if I don't believe that, then the image I have myself is going to reflect something else. But so we have to understand that whatever our self image is, it's a reflection of something else. It's a reflection of a, of a, of a, of a set of truth claims from one source or another. And we know what basically those two sources are, God or the enemy. And the enemy has captured the world. So um, don't let anybody rob you of that, of that language. It's very important language. So I just wanted to add that. Good. So reason number two, I think a couple of you said that you resonated with this. I've not earned the good that I'm receiving, and it's not right for me to accept this. And we know that the culprit in this is pride, right? So when we're not caught up in works being, uh, we're, we can earn our this gift, right? then we want to reject it because then we feel like there's something that we owe in order to receive it, right? Um, if we're in Christ, God pours his best into our lives in big ways and in small ways because he loves us, right? If you offer me a gift out of friendship and I refuse to accept what you offer unless I pay you for it, haven't I just offended you? Basically, what I'm saying is I'll define the value that this has, right? And I'll give you, give that to you in exchange. You don't get to give a gift to me unless I'm invested in the exchange. I won't be a part of it. Who's that about? That's about us, right? That's not about the giver. That's about the receiver. 
So for us to feel like we have to invest something of our own in order to gain, keep, maintain, or preserve God's gift is to turn it into something other than a gift. Gifts are given out of affection, not out of earned. And we know that Satan loves to twist things so that we can't enjoy the good things that God so freely gives his children. So when Christ blesses, his motive is not to make us feel guilty, right? Romans 8.1 gives us that confirmation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? His motive is not to make us feel guilty because we've not earned it. His purpose is that we enjoy the blessings and that we're grateful for them so that we can live into that life that we learned and talked about back in the worthy lesson, right? The good that God intended would be our way of life. So this is one of those stopping points that I wanna spend a minute. Talk to me about your favorite human gift that had a deep impact on you. I have one. Um, my uh, my son, one year for um, for my birthday, he learned to play a song that I liked on the piano, and it was a complete surprise. Okay, so come up with a couple adjectives to describe that. Thoughtful. Um, Knowing, um, invested, committed. Yep, good. And very specific for you. He knew that mm -hmm. you would enjoy it. Wouldn't mean mm -hmm. the same to me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Who else? Right. Who else can share about their favorite human gift that had a deep impact on them? I can. Or, go ahead, Tracy. Um, well, my favorite human gift was when I used to work out in the field um, as a field tech. And I went to this um, customer's home and when I got there um there was like a weight in his house and it was like really really uncomfortable you know for me to be there so I immediately started praying and I was like Lord you know just um can you make everything run smoothly because there's a spirit here that's making me uncomfortable and I want to get out and so the Lord spoke to me and said well, yeah, but you're going to have to pray for the man before you leave. And I was like a new employee for my company. And so I was like, for real, God, because, you know, I don't know him and he doesn't know me. And, you know, um, what if he reports me? And, you know, I don't know. So the computers just wouldn't work. I mean, everything just kept breaking down. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And the Lord kept saying, you're going to have to pray for him before you leave. So finally I said, okay, God, um, just make everything smooth and I will do whatever your will is. And so after that, as soon as I said that, the software took and everything just started working the computer was up. And so here comes the enemy. Well, it's up now, just walk out. But I had a um, fear of the Lord of what would happen if I just did that when I had already committed that I would pray for this man. So after um, I got up and I packed my things up and I got to his door, I turned around and I said, excuse me, sir. You know, I said, this might feel, sound strange to you, but I really feel like, you know, God spoke to me today and he's saying that you need prayer. And the guy said to me, wow, I knew it was something different about you when you came in the door. Yes, I'll take the prayer. 
So I began to pray for him. And after I prayed for him, the spirit that was hovering around in his home was like lifted. And when we got done praying, I remember seeing him, he had tears in his eyes of like joy. And um, after that, you know, I left and I remember walking down the hallway, you know, going back to my um, van. I was like, Lord, thank you, God, for, you know, the obedience that I had. Thank you, God, for using me. And um, thank you, God, that he was blessed. And just the, what you did in that moment. You know, so that was one of my, like, one thing that's happened to me that is just really life-changing. Very cool. So um, can you think of some adjectives to describe that? It's a little bit different than a, than a human one, because there's obviously Holy Spirit interaction in that, which is a little bit different, but um, yeah. What adjectives can you come up with to describe that? Oh, gosh. Um, okay, Ob obedience. Um, there was some fear uh, there in the beginning um, and some doubt, you know, um, but then I also had, um, eventually I developed faith, trust. Um, and what else? Hmm, that's all I can think of at the moment. I would say that you also gained a little bit of um, confidence that you can trust that when God is wanting to use you that way, that that's um, from him, right? So you you sharpened a little bit more of your discernment in your, your being obedient, right? And the confidence that he will use you in that way when you're obedient to him, right? And I love that you shared that it is a little bit fearful because God puts us in lots of situations that are his fear, that fear is different, right? But it still has, needs the same outcome, right? We still need to be surrendered to him, right? Mm -hmm. One more, one more person share possibly. I'll share one. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Thanks. Sorry. No, you're okay. So we, my husband and I have had to move a lot in the last 12 years. And so our kids have kind of had to, have been more stable than their parents have been and where they've lived. And, but somehow they always surprise me. I've had, for my birthday, my daughter just rang the doorbell and surprised me with a visit. And then um, when she was visiting, she made arrangements for her brother to meet, him, meet her here. And when I, they got off the ferry, there they both were and no one told me anything. So they've been able to pull that off. And to me, that's just, that is just, it was so joyful. Right? Um, and I was honored that they thought of me and knew how, how excited I would be because there was lots of screaming and jumping and hugging and stuff. Um, so I, I think those, they're the biggest blessings in my life. Mm -hmm. It's so huge. And there's a specific kind of blessing that when our children think of us as, as moms is later on in life and we've poured out all this energy and sacrifice when they're thoughtful in that way. Yeah, that speaks. Yeah, because when we moved the first time we took our daughter, you know, our daughter was still young enough that she had to move. And I was the, you know, most horrible, terrible mother of all because I made her move. But, you know, to see her now with me is so exciting. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And think about that when we respond to God, right? So combining both you and Tracy, when we respond to him in obedience, how wonderful that that is for him, right? How that glorifies him and how, you know, I just imagine him celebrating and going, yeah, good job, you know, good and faithful servant. So yeah. Thank you ladies for sharing. 
So we can never earn even the smallest of God's blessings. And we know that when we're surrendered to him, we know that when he gives us these gifts that are intentional in our lives that only he could answer, right? He knows and he doesn't expect anything out of us. He simply wants us to love him, right? With all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, right? To thank him. And to do our best to be obedient to him because it's in our best interest to do so. He's gone through a whole lot of work to prove that over, you know, thousands and thousands of years. He gave us a whole book to show us, look, I've been pursuing you humans, right? I've been trying all the way from the beginning to prove to you that I want the best things for you, right? Ultimately to the place of providing his son, right? To pay the atonement for our sins so that we can be in blessed relationship with him. And so this is a real important place to make sure that we're starting to get a, a, a sense of that understanding, right? Some people won't be able to receive this here, right? They won't be able to receive the gift. Um, when we start talking about some of the questions, um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So it really is prideful to think that we could add any value to the priceless blessings of God, right? So reason number three, I know how to live the old life. I don't have any idea how to live this new one, right? Many of us can connect with that. A couple of you shared that's definitely where you are. And the culprit is fear, right? normal for us to resist change after all we are created in god's image and he never changes right it's also normal for us to experience at least a little fearfulness over the unknown this new life and what the future holds is full of unknowns we tend to fall into life patterns and get stuck there and we easily get comfortable and entrenched in what is most familiar most comfortable we're creatures of habit, and it's hard for us to quit old habits and equally hard to form new ones because we have to put off the old to put on the new, right? And we know that going through Unbound, we've collected a wonderful system of tools, right, of how to put off. But do we trust the put on, right? Do we know what that looks like? Sometimes we don't, right? Some of us, we've had a hard time trusting in this new way and trusting God's way is better than our way, right? Trusting that the good that God intended would be our way of life is true. Because remember what we're focusing on is what we're saturating on. What we're saturating on is what we learn to believe and what we believe is, you know, the rest of the line, right? So as we discipline ourselves into following a new pattern of thinking and behaving, and as we accept the blessings of a new way of living, the strange becomes familiar, the unknown becomes every day, and soon we're just as rooted in our new pattern of living as we are in our old. Given enough time and enough success, we lose our desire to give up and go back. And the new habits that we form today become the old habits of tomorrow, right? Any of you have something that you can look back on that you were working on diligently for a while and now it's just second nature. You don't even really think about it anymore. It's become such a new way of, of doing life. Have you had some fruitful experiences in that? Maybe our thought life and the way that we think about people, think about people's opinions of us right? Think about um, our stature and where that is in life, right? Do we trust God more or people more, right? Subtle changes, one step at a time. So reason four, <clears throat> I'm going to blow it sooner or later. I may as well just get over it, get it over with. The culprit is self-loathing, how many of you, this is the first time that you've heard that term self-loathing? Everybody's heard it forever. Okay. Sometimes I'm, I'm always surprised when people haven't heard that term because it's so much a part of what we do. But um, so to loathe is to experience strong dislike or disgust, 
an intense aversion to someone or something. Self-loathing is a strong dislike or disgust towards oneself, right? And it's a thought pattern where individuals believe that they're inferior, bad, worthless, unlovable, or incompetent. We can believe that God loves everybody in the whole wide world except us. We can believe that God gives good gifts to everybody else in the world, but not us. We believe that God can use all other believers, but not us, right? The best that we can expect of ourselves is more failure and more reasons for shame. So why try? The truth of the matter is we are no less created in the image of God than the next person. In fact, if we've accepted Christ as our savior, we are nothing less than the adopted children of God that he talks about in John 1, 12 and Romans 8, 14, 17. Seeing ourselves with this new identity is an antidote to this lie. And as we saturate on this truth, we learn to see ourselves as God sees us and live our lives with the joyful freedom in Christ. Remember what we learned when we we're talking about emotions, that where the root of knowing is, right? A joy, right? That the root of joy is knowing, right? No other emotion gives that to us, right? That comes from that calm confidence, right? And when we know who God is, we know who we are, we can rejoice and we're so full of freedom because we know our place, we know our standing, we know our father, we know our savior. And we begin to understand that because of who we are in Christ, that we have nothing to prove, nothing to justify, and nothing to defend because he has already proven and justified us, as he talks about in Romans 5, 1 and 2. He ongoingly defends us before the Father, even when we're not doing everything perfectly, even when there are sin in our life that we're not even aware of yet. He's already covered all of that at the cross, right? He's covered all of the three variations of sin, right? Trespass, sins we don't know about yet. So what do we do? We stay with it, surrendering to and trusting the process. Such a counselor thing to say, right? until we become comfortable in the new life that our savior has prepared for us, right? We don't give up and we don't turn back. Each and every day, we'll see fruit of our faithfulness in yielding our lives to Christ and saturating with his word. Even in the spite of difficulties, you'll find that life grows better and better with him. You've already started to learn to enjoy and appreciate a wonderful new life in Christ, maybe to a fuller degree than you have before. This is his gift and his plan for you. And he's working right alongside you to help you grow into the noble man or woman of God that he created you to be, right? So I already talked a little bit about this passage, but um, what are your thoughts about this passage and why it's here? Why is it important? Were any of you surprised that it was here? Anybody confused by the connection? <laughs> well, yeah, Lauren, um, maybe you can expound on it or Kelly, like why it's here. You're talking about the verse, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kelly, this has been significant for you, I know, and I know for some other people. Why don't you talk through your connection with it first? Um, this was a really challenging passage for me to trust. Um, 
And so when, um, how God has used this passage, it's probably the single most um, uh, homework passage that I give <laughs> because consistently people cannot trust what God is doing in their life. Things are too good to be true, right? And when God is doing things in your life that are too good to be true, where he's using you in a way that is specific. Some of these adjectives we talked about earlier, right? Specific, it's thoughtful. It's the deepest inner yearnings of your soul, right? And when he's showing you, I hear you, daughter. I, I am, I'm hearing you. I put that on your heart. That is such an overwhelming place of holiness. He gave us this passage for this reason, right? When you think about where it is in James, my theology has changed a little bit on it, but I can't tell you how many times when I'm so humbled by having a very good friend love me just the way I needed to be loved in a, a day or do something thoughtful or send a gesture. Um, old habits for me would be to reject it, to the self-sabotage was probably one of the first conversations I had with Warren was, okay, talk to me about self-sabotage because I see it, but I don't know what to do about it. I am the queen of self-sabotage. And it is this passage that God has used to help heal that need to take things up the way that I knew how to survive, right? That self-protective place. So when we can say with confidence, every good and perfect gift is from above. God is perfect. He knows the intentionality of our heart. He, he's the one that put it there, right? He knows our need. And so, and the other part of this passage that really hits home as far as tying everything up together and unbound is it's rooted on him. It's back to him, right? By his sovereign plan, he gave us new birth through the message of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits that he created. Well, that first fruits is pretty powerful for somebody who comes from a long history of familial abuse, right? trusting that this is the first fruit and knowing it's okay right that's his intention in my life so it's um it's and i've seen this passage it do exactly that when i'm walking alongside other survivors right i don't believe i can't believe and trust that god is doing this thing i'm like okay well what does this passage say and what is it on the back end of right it's right after james is over there lecturing us about where our faith needs to be right and he's telling us that we're going to have struggles and we're supposed to take joy and struggle, right? So it's a powerful passage for that reason. And the other thing about this lesson, uh, the first couple of times I walked somebody through Unbound or did it in a group, I texted Warren. I'm like, this, this lesson doesn't belong here. It needs to be in a different place than Unbound. And his, he's like, oh, well, where would you put it? And I'm like, well, I would put it uh, back in the back before um, you start talking about uh, the last goal, which isn't coming to my brain right now. And he's so patient sometimes with my inquiries. Okay, so you would have them talk about the way they self-sabotage before you've helped them recognize their bitterness, their anger, you know, but I'm like, oh, I see. So it's changed over the years, how I interact with it. What's the key theme of self-sabotage? It's really not taking God at face value. It's not accepting and believing what God has declared to be. So that's the key message of, of this passage. Think back to uh, lesson one, the reflection that says, when did you experience a sense of, of being treated with, with a greater worthiness than you than you experienced. It just seemed all of a sudden this somebody was treating you with and, and giving you a sense of worthiness that was uncommon, that wasn't normal. Okay. That was God through that person letting you know that you matter to him. And like Kelly said, I hear the cries of your heart and they matter. That was a gift from God through that person. It wasn't a gift from that person. It was a gift through that person. So shifting our focus back to God 
and getting us to the place where we're able to say, yeah, even though I'm having a hard time accepting this new life, even though I'm having a hard time accepting these gifts that are from God in Christ, even though I have a hard time even getting my mind around the fact that this is what the rest of my life is going to be built on and look like. None of this has anything really to do with me. This has to do with God's design, his plan, his purpose. And the, the key thing about this is all so that we would be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Okay. It's, it's an early pushing of the reset button where God's original design is being recaptured and reinstituted in our life, even though it got fractured and broken along the way. So if we're able to get a hold of the ideas in these two verses, we're able to walk away from self-sabotage and develop a distaste for self-sabotage that relegates it to something that used to be a part of a life but no longer is. So let's talk about day one reflections. We're gonna ask for a little bit of feedback here. Why do you, why, why, wow, can't talk. Why would you deliberately sabotage your life when you are doing well? And why would you feel drawn to return to the life that you had before? So some of our interactions touched on this already, but um, how did you guys respond to this? And I know some of you did because I've seen your homework. So if you don't share, I'll pick on you. It's teasing. Deb? Oh, okay. Um, so I, you know, I just said, and especially the older you get, habits are hard to break. Um, you just get set in your ways and it's, and you know, if you're, whether you're at home or at work, especially at work too, it's hard to even break habits there. Um, and so then as you, you gradually, you know, put off the old and put on the new and you're just in this really good pattern. And then it, sometimes it can just take a trigger that can set you back. Um, and I, that's what I find is it's usually some kind of trigger that puts me back into that old habit. And that old habit was comfortable and easy. And so you just kind of tend to keep going there. And then it takes usually something else or, you know, a friend or something to say, why are you doing this? Or then I, or I have that feeling that God is nudging me saying, okay, why are you doing this? You need to change your pattern again and get out of this old habit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of, it, it's just so easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah, changing patterns takes intentionality, right? Right. I think there's also, for me, an element of struggling with God, wanting to, I, I felt very much over the course of the last year or so that I'm wrestling with God, like, um, yeah. And I, you know, I, I don't like some of what he's done or the answers that he's giving me. So that's why. I will find myself falling back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sandra, say, one of the th th things I noticed that when I deliberately go back to some of the anger and some of the, the, the snappiness that I have, it's because the new life isn't getting me the outcome that I want. Mm -hmm. And so I know that if I go back to the way that I used to be, I'll get that outcome that I want. And, and, and so it's kind of difficult to continually remind myself that God's way is better than mine. Well, and is it really the outcome you want? No, it's the one I think I want. Right. And that that that's the self-deception piece we got to watch out for, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's shorter, right? It's a quicker, quicker fix ish, but it's got some long-term impact, right? That doesn't get you to the fruitful life. It's a cheap, cheap substitute, right? Yeah. So, Dave, oh, go ahead. 
I was oh. just gonna say that I, I also think that depending on where somebody's at in their journey and how ingrained the lies are that you've believed, it is easier to self-sabotage because there hasn't been as much time saturating. Even if someone's gone through this already, maybe it's the first time and there's still just a lot of work that needs to be done um, you know, facing those lies. So it's just easy to, once you just go down that road to just continue in that. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that affects it. Yeah. Do you think that everybody is deliberately sabotaging? Do you think they're aware that they are deliberately sabotaging when they're doing You know, that? I had a hard time with that question. I think, I, like, a minute. I think there's a difference between deliberately sabotaging and knowing you're deliberately sabotaging. Well, I'm getting there. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, what did you, so a difference between deliberately sabotaging and knowing you're deliberately sabotaging? That yes, saying? yes. Okay. I guess I'm seeing them as the same thing. So help me out here. No, 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 you, you know, if you're habituated. You don't have to be delivered about, about that second nature of habituation. Remember lesson three, yeah, lesson yeah. 11 and 12. Okay. It's okay. second nature habituation. You've fallen back into the old habituation. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be intentional about it. It's an old habit. Okay. Which means you've surrendered the ground that you and God have taken back from the enemy. Okay. Because you're okay. not believing that the victory really is yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reason I was asking that, Kirsten, is because sometimes when we're walking alongside or if there's a deep um, self-protectedness in us that we weren't sure that we didn't know was there, that won't come out necessarily until we've been in a safe environment for a longer period of time. That's, these are these finite, you know, well entrenched, just they're habitual, but they're more connected to the deeper wounding that we um, interacted with when we were younger. So we're not really aware that we're doing those things. And so helping people recognize it is a huge piece, which is why this was such a powerful lesson for me, right? There were still some things that were in there um, it's taken years for God to get a hold of those and to trust that he wanted better, right? So that deliberately, hopefully they're doing, you know, they've done a thorough job as they've come out of lesson 11 and 12 and they have a, an idea, right? So now you can have that honest conversation. Do you know that you're doing that on purpose, right? And, you know, Cindy, I know we can speak to, we have people we know, they know what they're doing. There's an intentionality to sabotage because to sabotage feels more safe. It feels more comfortable than leaning into the good that God intended, right? And so, um, yeah, that was why I was asking the question. Thank you. Um, okay, so Kelly, I have um, a thought that just like came up. Yep. As we were talking about that and then how Warren talked about habitually doing stuff. Um, and I think this just occurred to me today, just now, um, that I do, I've been, do, started doing something, a natural habit that I will normally do. Um, so I'm in truth and love and I'm going through this process, right? Um, and as we're getting to the end of this class, you know, and I've been kind of like feeling like struggling. So then I go, well, you know what? Maybe I'll just see if I can get my money back and I'll just start like a whole nother program and just start over, you know, which is like kind of like my habit of doing things like starting something. Then when it's like, huh, then I'll go, well, it's better to start something new because then it'd be like fresh and you know, new, that's kind of like what came to me today because <laughs> I've been doing that, you know, um, kind of just like feeling like, oh, well, I remember when I looked at this, how come I, you know, I did the shooting. Why did, <laughs> you know, I should have did this, you know? So I noticed like certain habits that I did. I wouldn't say it was totally self-sabotaging, but I can see like some, some habits in there that are going back. So it's kind of like keeping me or prolonging 
the process that God has for me so, to do what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, so if it's not you sabotaging your ability to walk out God's plan, who is it? Because it's either self-sabotage or other sabotage. So, Okay, it, it's me. Okay, <laughs> I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. You know, um, but yeah, and part of that is probably like some fear, you know. Um, well, but think about this. It's like, um, it's like being in being in a romantic relationship. When things start to get too serious, you leave and you start a new one because you know how to do fresh and early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sticking it out, no, I don't know how to do that. Oh, wait a minute, doesn't that sound, sound like I know how to live the old life? I don't know how to live the new one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and not to get too personal, Tracy, but well, you open the can of worms, so I can get. I used to do that, so thank you. <laughs> Um, that is one of the ways that the enemy gets us. He knows that we need community. And in your story specifically, he knows you're craving it, that you need it, right? And that you've been hungering for it for a long time. And so, you know, that um, you connecting with this is your church, so huge. I mean, I have a church that I belong to, but in many ways, this is still my church, you know? And um that is how the enemy will sneak in and take us away and take us captive. That's easier. It's easier to start something new, but is it really right? Right. Yeah. It takes years to get a pair of Levi's worn in nice and snug where they're comfortable and right. So you're just at the place where you've washed it a few times and you give a little more time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's talk about, thank you all for sharing. Uh, day two. What do you think God requires of you? And this is a high participation question that you are unable to give him or do for him. What do you think God requires of you that you are unable to give him or do for him? It's a great question. I have difficulties forgiving as I've been forgiven. Mm. What about the language for him in the question? I, uh, I love Micah 6, 8. And, um, you know, to do justice, okay, I'm on board with that. To love mercy, I'm on board with that. And to walk humbly with my God, that is really difficult. Like walk, continuing to walk with the Lord and being humble about it, that's really hard. I read a book recently about humility that I think was written in the 40s or something by a South African pastor and it was all about humility and meekness and um it was really transformative for me because when i what i've realized is whenever i'm in a difficult or stressful situation or um having conflict with a person or pers you know on the verge of having conflict when i can Put myself in a position of humility it changes everything you know it gives me all the power to surrender the ground and you know think of the other person the way you know as much as i can the way god thinks of them so but that is the one that i have to continue to remind myself of humility peace What else? Thank you for sharing that. What else about the language? Does God require or um, anything that he asks us to do for him? Are we doing it for God? It was last week we were talking about that we do things with God, not for God. Um, 
but I'm not sure why that's in the question. That's <laughs> why we, why you're saying that. Because it's a trick question. Just kidding. It's the only question. <laughs> it's the only one of the reflections. It's kind of a trick. It's not really, but kind of to see if anybody catches the subtlety of the language. And we can say we can do it for the purpose of honoring God, but as far as doing it for him, doing as, a, as an offering to bring to him, something like that, but just to do it for him, we really don't do anything for God. And again, that's one of those subtle things in the, in the language it, and it's there to see who picks up on it and who doesn't yet. So there's, it's really no right or wrong, but we really, hopefully, people are starting to recognize, yeah, like you said, yeah, there's something about that language that doesn't quite set right. I'm not sure what it is. Because remember, it's in those subtleties that the enemy is going to try to get take ground back. Because he, he, he can't catch us full on anymore. Right. So he's going to try to do the more the, the more subtle, sneaky things now. And this is kind of a, OK, where's your discernment? Mm -hmm. And it's a little different than as we're looking at uh, the self-destruct bondage cycle and the renewed mind cycle. Right. Because what Dave was referring to, what Sandra is referring to. Right. Those are things that we know are those are weak areas for us. We recognize them. We recognize that. God can't fully use us when those ego places are leading, right? So it's not about we're letting those things down. We're letting go of those things and letting God uh, heal us from those or take those from us so that we can be more um, used by him in the way that he designed us to be used. So it's not about doing it for him, right? It's kind of like the reflecting his glory, right? We're not bringing him more glory. He's already got all the glory there is, right? Good, good discussion. Okay, we're running behind time. It's chatty, just so chatty today. Um, day three, list ways that you self-sabotage and make your own life difficult. What do you think your reasons are for doing so? Anybody wanna chime in on that? What do you think we're looking for here? So we've already laid some pretty good groundwork, but what do you think? Why do you think it's phrased this way? What are we hoping for? I don't know what you're hoping for, but to kind of going back to the my, my day one reflection, it's because I think it's going to make my life easier. That's the reason I give myself the old way was easier and it got you the results that you thought you wanted mm -hmm. i mean i can still uh, october 7th of 2011 was i'm sorry 2000 yeah 2010 2000 yeah october 7th 2010 the last time i dropped an f-bomb on someone and i can remember specifically when why and and the reasons i did so and, you know, thinking back to, I, you know, feeling that anger welling inside of me and thinking I can continue to give the example of Christ uh, or I can give them what, what I want to give them. And I ended up giving them what I wanted to give them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's turned back really... in that angry staff NCO that I had been for many years. And I can remember almost in tears on my way home, calling my wife saying, you will not believe what I did today. And then she was just as, she was surprised. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an excellent example to see if, so the kind of the hope or the, and what you're hoping that they're getting out of it, not that there's a right or wrong is, are they in tune with their own um, being honest with their own things that trip them up, right? Are they aware of when they are self-sabotaging, right? And making their, and how does it make their life difficult, right? So I can imagine in that, Dave, that, you know, there's, uh, 
there's embarrassment, there's, you know, a whole lot of other things that you're dealing with on the other side of that, that are far from who God wants you to be. And for whatever reason, he allowed you to feel that really deeply in that place, right? So that you would remember and not return to it, right? Um, yeah. And I think that it just reminds me, the way you describe that reminds me a lot of that passage we talk about in 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10, right? That when God calls us to repent of something, it's for life, right? Because he wants us to let go of it. I think there's also a lack of confidence or belief that we really are no longer slaves to what we were once enslaved by. Mm -hmm. Don't have to live as slaves to those things. And so it's usually a lack of a solid enough faith and confidence in what God declares to be so about us. That's usually where the battlefield is going to be. Right? Oh. Good. So day four, we'll just go through these kind of quickly. Sorry. Do you have trouble receiving gifts? And when someone gives you a gift simply because they care for you, it pays you a compliment, how do you respond? Is this a hard question for anybody? Many people don't like to receive a compliment because they don't know what to do with it, right? Yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> I get a compliment and I turn it to a negative or I say some, I feel the need to dismiss it. it or yeah, say something negative. Because mm -hmm. heaven forbid, if you accept it, and then as soon as you do, they go, ah, I was only kidding. And then you, you feel like a bigger fool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, and I look at the gifts question as just like, you know, like something tangible, like, you know, um, like a gift gift. When I got like some towels or something, I looked at it like that. Oh, I, and, and so I answered the question, no. But um, when Noelle just kind of described the compliment thing, I guess that I have a hard time receiving the compliments too, because usually if somebody gives me a compliment, I'll immediately just say, oh, they're lying, or they didn't really mean that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is the world of toxic shame, kids. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that this question, it's very cool to watch how God uses this, but um it's been fun to watch in the last couple of years. He's put several pe people in front of me who need to trust that uh, God will use them. And it's coming back to this that helps them understand God wants to use you, but they don't have a trust that the Holy Spirit works in them and they don't trust their discernment. Right. And um, being able to help them recognize that that gift of discernment, that that gift of being used by God is part of that receiving gifts, right? Because it gets back to what we were talking about uh, a few weeks ago when we were talking about um, procrastination, all connected to that same place, right? We put it off because if we start performing at a, at a standard that people come to expect, then that becomes our new, new normal, right? So rather than it being about people, it needs to be about what God is asking us to do. He is our standard. He's the one that defines this, right? Um, Sharon, you were going to say something. Did you forget? No, I was just going to say that, uh, Warren, you actually helped me a lot with the whole uh, receiving a compliment. You taught me how to say thank you and just um, and not be forced to like come up with something in response and just say thank you. That's very kind. I remember like literally practicing that in the mirror. Like, okay, I'm going to learn to say this and just be grateful and not feel like, you know, um, growing up, I, I was given a gift from my mom. That means I owed her or had to like somehow show that I loved it so much. And so this performance thing always comes out. And so I just remember that Warren and I, um, I, mean, I probably never told you, but I always practice in the mirror for a long time just so I can say it correctly and like, just be able to have the freedom. And I still struggle with it, but to say, to say, thank you. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but I'm going to say it and Warren can add it and then we'll finish our questions. And it reminds me because Sandra, you're talking about this, but Warren talks about humility this way. True humility is an accurate understanding and acceptance of our strengths and weaknesses, abilities and inabilities, 
without magnifying or minimizing either. So it's very easy for you to say, thank you. That's very kind of you. You don't owe, right? But we live in a world that wants to overinflate our ego. So mm -hmm. it's good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Okay, day five. Looking back at the major changes in your life, both voluntary and involuntary, how long did it take and how difficult was it for you to adapt and become accustomed to those changes? The changes you've been experiencing in this program are ones you look on willingly. Uh, what are your thoughts on adapting to these changes? And so we're, you know, it's a, a check-in to see, you know, if they're recognizing where changes happened to them or they happened for them or they were a willing participant in the change, right? And which, which side would you rather be on, right? And which of those were fruitful, right? And what, what did that look like? And then day six, when you consider the amazing purpose God has for your life, how willing are you to stick with his plan as he works it all out? What can you do to be more cooperative? So how did you guys respond to that? I'll just say that I really love the Colossians 2, 6 through 8. And I was just like, yes, that's my response. <laughs> I felt like it just um, said everything uh, that would answer that question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So just, you know, accepting Christ as your Lord, continue to follow him, let your roots grow down into him, uh, see your lives you built on him, then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and will overflow with thankfulness. So um, mm -hmm. I just say yes to that. So I, I love that that passage was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good. What's the hopeful hopefulness that we're we're leaving on this one? That God does have amazing purpose for us. And, um, I think as I've looked back or I've gone through this chapter before, I've always thought of self sabotage only in the negative. Like I'm not going to be in the pit. I'm not going to do these things. I'm going to put off this. Um, but just as we've been talking tonight, just thinking about the putting on and thinking about um, the amazing purpose that he does have the great things, not just the neutral, good, not in the pit things. <laughs> right. Um, so I, I have appreciated this conversation tonight. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's about you're invited to the table. What is what does he have? Right? Good. Okay. Thanks. That's all I have. Well, let's take a very quick break, check the indoor plumbing, come back in like six or seven minutes instead of 10. Okay. Thanks. So lesson 26 is our last lesson. And our saturation verse is one that we're all familiar with. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And we need to look at those as two sides to the same coin. Um, so when we're talking about this lesson, love God's way. This was, um, a lesson that, that I really believe we needed to use to tie the entire curriculum together. We've been talking all the way along about God's love for us. What does that mean then? What is love supposed to look like in our life? If we're created in his image, if he is love, if he created us for the purpose of loving us and one day inviting us to share in his glory, what's the significance of that? So you, as you can go through the lesson, you'll see that we, we flesh out the, the, the significance of the, this particular um, Greek word for love, agape, right? 
because we know that when people talk about love, they're not talking about agape. They, well, they are, but they don't think they are. They don't understand that what, that what they're longing for is and willing to settle for is something that is far less than the agape of God. So let's start on the, on the low end, okay? The low end is eros. That's the romantic love. That's the chemistry stuff. What's interesting is when you take a look at eros, eros is the name of the Greek God for love, which is not really love, but lust, right? And that has to do with the flesh. So you come up from there, you come up to the Greek word storge, which we don't see in the New Testament. But storge is that family love. It's the sense of family and community and that, that corporate love and belonging together. Well, obviously that doesn't have a romantic tint, taint to it, right? Then you come up another level and that's the phileo. That's the brotherly love. Think of Jonathan and David. Think of Jesus and the disciples and the, and the, and the, the, the relationships and their, their daily interactions and stuff. But then you come up to the highest level, which is actually the root of all, all love, and that's the agape. Right? And agape, so when it, sa when it says, Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another, agapao, that's a verb form. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. It is by this that everyone will know that you are that you are my disciples by how you love one another right so this and agapao is a verb form so we have to understand that the that experiencing agape love is agapao it's a verb it's an action it's something that we do no matter what our feelings happen to be no matter what our emotions happen to be so we define this as a passionate desire for God's best for another person more than you want it for yourself, even at great expense to yourself. And that's laid out for us actually in Philippians chapter two, when you start at verse three, where he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Instead, look out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. In going so far as to consider others as more important than you are. And Paul continues on, he says, this same mind that was in Christ should be in you, that even though in his very nature he was God, he did not consider his equality with God something to be grasped and held tightly to, but instead emptied himself, took on the form of man, and being found in our likeness, became a bondservant became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, right? Well, back in the Old Testament, it says, kerem, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. In other words, de de devoted to God for destruction. That's what it means to be cursed. Anathema is the word we see in the New Testament. So Christ was not, not benefiting from all of this. This was done for our benefit. Right? He laid aside everything that he was entitled to. He, was a, he laid aside all comfort and, con, uh, and, and, and consistency. He laid it all aside in order to grant us what God created us for that we had broken, remember lesson two, and continued to break. He himself became, as God, became his own remedy for our breaking his plan because of his love for us. And then he's telling us, as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. So it's a passionate desire for God's best for another person. 
more than you want it for yourself, even a great expense to yourself. It also gives without expe expectation of return. Like one of the verses that, that um, it's kind of an anchor verse for me is Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So that the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved agapao me and gave himself for me. So love gives self-sacrificially to another without expectation of return. And don't forget, this is command language, a new command I give you. So this takes the, the passage of Mark, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as itself, draws it all down and gives us a summary declaration of what that really means. So how, do we, how, how are we doing with other, just let's take other believers. Let's not take our enemies, love your enemies. Let's not take that. Let's take this brothers and sisters of Christ. Let's take how are we doing at agapao, other believers. Are we harsh, critical, judgmental toward them because they're not like us, don't see things the way we do, don't agree with us? make us uncomfortable. Or really believing that God is, God is working out his best to transform them more and more into the image of his son, just like he is us. Are we delighted that this person is going to be with us for eternity? Because if not, we're not really loving them. Are we just merely tolerating people? Do we get that internal stink face when we think about so-and-so? We see their name show up on our alerts, right? Do we do all we can to avoid having to have a conversation with that person? Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. There's that self-sacrifice again. God so loved the, the world that he gave his one unique son so that anyone who would put their faith and trust in him would not perish but instead have everlasting life. Because of his love for us, not because we were all so pretty or attractive or so nice, but in spite of what we were like, because he loved us, because he created us in his image. Do we really see other people as Imago Dei bearers? Do we really see that? Do we really celebrate that? Do we really try to draw that out of people? Oh, now, now. We're moving on toward what does Christian marriage look like? Because if that's how we're supposed to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, to be in a Christian marriage means that you have a brother and sister in Christ who are co-stewarding a marriage. It's supposed to be the, the ultimate example in their lives of what one anothering, a la John 13, is like. Not the least example, but the best example. That's what the one another's in the New Testament are like. They're supposed to be most manifested in that marriage relationship. Do we really give with that expectation of return? I tell you what, I've done a lot of marriage counseling, post-wedding counseling, where that's not the case. One of the things that's really important for us to, to, try, to rem, try to picture in our mind is every person that Jesus looked at he looked at through the lens of, I desire my father's absolute best for you more than I want it for myself. 
every single person that Jesus looked at. Even those that were trying to kill him to the point where they were, they were driving spikes through his wrists and his feet. And he's over and over and over, Father, please be forgiving them. Be forgiving them. They don't understand what they're doing. They don't know. They don't really, they don't get it. Let's back up to the easier, easier flavor of that. Are we, are we doing that for other brothers and sisters in Christ? Back in Psalm 15, one of the things that, that marks a uh, man or true man or woman of God is in his mind, the reprobate is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. Now, they may not love and honor God the way we do, but do they love and honor God the best that they know how? Yeah, a lot of them do. Do we really honor them or do we badmouth them because they're not like us? Do we badmouth them in our mind? Or in our heart, do we go to God and seek God's best for them? See, that's what it means to really be, truly means to be Christian. And then we take it to that next level. Now, what about those who hate you, who mistreat and maltreat you, who badmouth you, who, who character assassinate you, who do evil to you? Do you still desire God's best for them? Because if you don't, then you need to go to God and, and, and repentance and say, Lord, I don't know how to love this person the way you want me to. So I need you to love them through me. I experienced that. I, I, was, I was a new um, in, uh, ministry intern, pastoral intern at a church. And I went to work for this company owned by Mormons, and part of the crew I worked with was a gal who was the laziest human being I had ever met. She was the second most creative person I'd ever seen at getting out of work and not getting in trouble for it. And I loathed her. I even remember going outside, out back behind the, 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 the building one time, yelling at God. He could have, you could have made a perfectly decent human being out of this bones and flesh and hair. But no, you made her. Why did you do that? This went on for a couple of weeks and she got worse and worse and worse. And I got more and more, more angrier and angry and angry, and more bitter and more bitter and more bitter. <laughs> I heard a message on loving, not just loving believers who are supposed to be easier, but loving your enemies and praying for those who hate you. And she hated me. We hated each other, like, right? We are like fire and gasoline. So I was really upset with God. I was upset with a preacher too for the message, but I was really upset with God for giving him the message. And I said, okay, there's no way I can love this gal. I can't, there's no way I can. So you're gonna have to do it through me because I, 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 got, I got nothing. I ain't got it. I just can't do it. I cannot do it. You're going to have to do it through me. And every time I looked at her, when I would have just put her in a gunny sack and throw her in the river, back over with a car and then drive forward to make sure I got her. I 
I would pray, okay, I'm supposed to love her, don't know how, I can't stand her. She's breathing, she's breathing. Please make her stop. No, I'm supposed to love her, I don't know how, you're gonna have to do it through me. I mean, God and I had these conversations many times throughout the day. Someplace in the middle of all that, I stopped looking at her with disgust. I stopped rolling my eyes at her. Um, and I, I, can't, I can't track everything, the way it all happened, the progression of everything. But as I continue to pray, you're going to have to love her through me because I don't know how. I don't want to and I don't know how. But this is what you're asking of me, so you're going to have to do it through me. I was working on a, on a, on a project. And suddenly I felt this presence next to me, and it was her. And she looked up at me and she said, do you want some help with that? Um, yeah, sure. What, what do you want me to do? This is a conversation I never had had with her and never expected to have with her. But over the course of the next couple of weeks, I started noticing that she would smile when I got, when I got to work. She'd say hello to me. She offered to be helpful. She was looking for things to do, not looking for ways to dodge. I'm sitting there going, Lord, I don't, I don't get this. I don't know what's happening. Well, what I didn't realize was that he was changing my heart toward her. And she was responding to that. This went on for a couple of months and one day my boss came to me and he said, I really appreciate you investing in her. He says, cause I was the point where I was gonna have to fire her. And he says, I hate to fire anybody. He said, but um, you just worked wonders with her and she's now become a very valuable employee. And I'm thinking, I, did, I did really didn't do anything. I, I really didn't do anything other than surrender the whole thing to God and say, God, you need to do whatever needs to be done because I don't have that. <laughs> but I found myself joking and laughing with her and, you know, liking her. I thought, what happened? But it was God changing my heart toward her. Because as I continued to research and study this, well, okay, so what is this? What is this love one another, love your enemies? What does it even really look like? God brought more and more conviction about that, what that was supposed to look like. So that's really what this lesson grew, grew out of is what I've seen authentic believers model that reflects what the way Christ lived and loved. So it's not a matter, of, and there was nothing, there was nothing that this gal had to offer me other than disappearing. That would have been the greatest gift to me. But that was the desire of my flesh. That was just my pridefulness. See, because I wasn't desiring God's best for her. So then, as I started doing the healing work for the horrible life experiences I had growing up, God used that as a catalyst to help me understand what loving my enemies and praying for those who had horribly maltreated me. He used that to teach me what that, what that would look like. And it's been 
an ongoing learning process. But that's really what this lesson is about, tying all of this together. That as we look at the brokenness that we carry, as we look at the, the, the um, havoc that we have wreaked in the lives of others because we've carried an unforgiving and unloving spirit with us. The only way to remedy that is to surrender all of that and say, okay, Lord, I need to love these people the way you do. I don't know how to do that. There's a part of me that doesn't want to. So you're even going to have to give me the want to to want to because I don't even have that. But all the way back to goal one, the key, two keys that unlock the safety deposit box of freedom in Christ are surrender and saturation. Whenever there's an obstacle, it, you can look to, okay, Lord, what is it I'm holding on to and not surrendering? I'm holding on to something that's not of you. It's not from you. It's not for you. And you'd be, you'd be amazed at how hidden those, those things can be. So remember we talked about how, we, how negative we can feel when somebody pays us a compliment or offers us a gift. We're actually not loving that person. We're also not loving God because every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights. So when someone is extending a kindness to you, if someone is giving a compliment to you, if someone is affirming you, if somebody is doing, giving you something, remember, God is doing that through them. So it's actually God, it's not them. They just happen to be available to God. When we really lay hold of the reality of the Imago Dei and other human beings, it makes it a lot easier for us to agapao them. Because we're celebrating the image of God in them. So it's more than just who they are in the flesh. One of the key passages that we, I will often take people to, and we've talked about this before, I'll often take them to Romans 5 and have them read verses 6, 8, and 10, and which gives us a baseline for loving others, even our enemies, because this is God's baseline for loving us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. How much more, since we have been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? So while we were helpless, ungodly sinners who were God's enemies, he loved us, loved us, loved us, sacrificed himself for us. So when it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, there's no other commandment greater than these. Those are encapsulated. It is, as I have loved you, so you are to love one another. And the one another's are the body of Christ. It's our first obligation. It's the brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you happen to be married, to a brother and sister in Christ, that's the ultimate one anothering relationship you're involved in. So. As we look at the um, day one reflection, how was your understanding of love 
impacted by this lesson? And how do you think this might um, think this might have? What effect do you think this might have going forward? How did you all respond to that? The, oh, we say we, it's not give and take, it's give and receive. Yeah. Yeah. Give and take means give me that that's mine. Give and receive is thank you for what you're living. Yeah. 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 That's one of those examples of words matter. And it's usually the small words that matter most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Other thoughts on this one? Anyone say thank you, Warren, for messing with my theology? Warren, I think this this lesson was instructive to me in regards mostly to those who um, are difficult to love and that I may want to avoid or hold in judgment and realizing, um, like you told me before, God is their judge. I am not. My role is to obey him to love them as he loves them because they are made in his image at the very least starting there and viewing them as worthy of God's love and therefore they're worthy of my love and um, just leaving that whatever's going on in their life I really appreciate what you said a little while ago about honoring them for the place where God has them in their life not expecting them to be where you are not holding them to a standard that isn't um, what you think maybe could be or ought to be, just leaving that all to the Lord and just doing what he gives us to do right now. It's very freeing. It takes away a lot of fear too and a sense of responsibility. So I appreciated it yeah, a lot. I appreciate that. So um, day two, what do you think God expects from you now? What are you going to have the greatest trouble being obedient to and why? That covers the gamut of obviously this lesson, but the whole curriculum all together, really. When you look at, anybody care to share what they saw as, um, what God is, what is it God is asking of me now that I'm going to have the greatest trouble with? For me, I, I was just going to say it's important, the thought life, like how you were sharing in your story, Warren, of the things you were thinking about that woman and to be really intentional about capturing every single thought, every single moment and surrendering that. Like, and it's a, sometimes all day long <laughs> for that specific person. So I think that's um, hard to do, especially when yeah. you have to. Well, and, and God, in that whole process, God says, so what about the Imago Day in her? Oh, you would bring that up now. Thank you. Yeah. Sharon, you started to say something. Um, so... I, I kind of took it as, so the, the way it impacted me, this question, I started to realize just um, how overwhelming it can, it is to understand how God loves me that much. So I get like teary eyed when I think about it. So, so I think that's the part I think is I struggle with is God is trying to like explain that to me because I have so much trouble with it. That's why I go to like the Hallmark movies because I, I I feel comfortable in the, you know, like that romantic kind of love setting because it's hard to really accept because there's this like almost um, a peaceful, relaxing, like fun, like just a settling that feels unsettling when I start to understand that. And then to be, understanding that when I look at my children or people I struggle with and customers and seeing how that's going to be reflected on them. Um, so sometimes I see myself being overwhelmed and, um, and so that's, I think, going to be the greatest struggle for me is to really just start to 
let it sink in instead of like just trying to push it away or push it to the side or, you know, go back to my old uh, habits um, of what, you know, the superficial, like just wanting to live in superficial. And so that's how I took it um, and what I was thinking of. And that's then getting to that place where you say, okay, Lord, I ain't got this. So you're going to need to do this through me because I, I, I don't got this. I, I got nothing to bring to the table here. You, you'll be amazed. Even though you've got somebody who you're going to have to extend grace to from a distance. What's missing is the anger, the animosity, the vengefulness. All of that stuff ends up being replaced by a sadness. A, a, a grieving over what could be but can't be. So then, so my, then I have a follow-up question. So is, so it makes sense to have like a sense of panic of like, okay, well, now I don't know what to do because I'm used to living in anger. I'm used to living in this. And so then that sometimes the fear sets in of like, okay, so then now what do I do? And so then I find myself, um, I mean, is that crazy? Yeah, I'm surrendering control. So I don't know what to do now. And it, That's where the panic comes from. Okay, because I but letting God be God. Because I have those panic moments, but I'm like, wow, this feels really great. And then I just want to go, well, you know, this is way too comfortable or it feels too good. And so I want to need to hold. You know, there, there is counseling for that. <laughs> Stinking counseling. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that place, Sharon, is exactly where saturation on this passage comes in because you're turning that gratitude to God. I want to trust your goodness more than my fear. I want to look at day four reflection. When you consider the people who are most difficult to love in your life, what do you think God wants you to do about that? And how willing are you? Can I comment on the question? Sure. Because one of the things I, <clears throat> I really appreciate about the way that it was worded is like sometimes we don't think of people as an enemy, but when you think about it, it's like, okay, this person's difficult to love. It's like, that, those are the people Jesus are calling us to love. That's the, the enemy, but we don't necessarily frame it that way. So we kind of justify throwing them under the bus. Mm -hmm. um, at least that was one of the things I've been wrestling with as going through Unbound a couple of times now is like, who's that person that's my enemy? Well, it's, it's maybe not the person that I quote unquote think would be my enemy. It's the person I don't love or the person I'm having a hard time loving. Mm -hmm. Good night, Dave. So, yeah, appreciate that. Um, We've got just a few minutes left. So any final questions, final observations before you before we turn you loose to dig deep and prepare for you teaching next week? Uh, Warren, I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, back to lesson 25. Um, how is there, how, can you make more of a distinction between number one, reason number one and, one and four? Because sometimes I feel like I have a hard time thinking like they don't somehow converge. Are, are you are you talking about um, less than twenty five? You're talking about yeah, the, the, the the okay, um, the four culprits as we call them, right? Well, so there's a difference between I'm going to blow it sooner or later. I may as well get it over with, and I'm no good. I don't deserve the better life. Okay. In other words, um, God is no business. I've got no business thinking that that this is really for me. So that has to do with self, with your sense of worth. I'm going to blow it sooner or later. I may as well get it over with. That has to do with your performance.
Thank you. That makes more sense. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Last thoughts? Questions? Observations? I just want to thank you and Kelly for your, your patience and, and uh, being here every week with us or with me and guiding me through this. It's been, um, I don't know for everybody else, but it, you know, from week one to now I am tired. It is exhausting. <laughs> And I've tried to keep up and, you know, I just find myself getting, you know, not able to do as much as I would like to do, but, um, but I do want to thank you for everything that you've done. I've learned a lot. I have a lot more to learn. Uh, well, I can see. Now, now's your opportunity to partner with somebody and actually go through it one lesson at a time at the speed. Yeah, it would be awesome. Yeah. I, I wish I had those connections. Yeah. You've I, got a room full of people right here. <laughs> I don't know. I was like, we'll see. Are you sure you don't want to tell us which 11 chapters you're going to do? No. Why would I do that? Are you kidding? And, and it's not like being in the same room together. Uh, because when we're in the same room together, it can get real tough. Well, I, I admire all of you moms that are doing this. I'm, I'm going to be taking care of my granddaughter this week, who's never been away from her mommy, and her mom's having a little surgery. So I got a feeling I'm going to have my hands full this week. So pray for me. Yes. But you guys are awesome that you've been able to do this class and, and uh, still have your families. But thank you. Well, thank you for that couple more minutes. Very welcome. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, Debbie, thank you for sharing um, that you were kind of feeling exhausted because I definitely um, am feeling extremely exhausted. You know, I thought I was like, you know, something was wrong with me or something. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, I'm just getting older. That's my <laughs> problem. <laughs> Well, I feel like this, the, the Unbound did a lot of work on our hearts. Oh, so, um, it's exhausting. That I didn't really expect. Oh, absolutely. You know, physically and emotionally, you know, yeah, it's exhausting. But uh, I can see why you need it two and three times, because I just feel like I've just covered this, you know, barely got through the surface. And you're, you're like talking about, okay, let's relate this to this. Well, yeah, I get it. But you're, you're right now, you're still having to point that out to me. But I think I have to go through it again and again in order to put, it's like a puzzle. And you've got to put all those pieces together. And um, so, yeah, I can see why. But I have two copies of this book now, the old one and the new one. I can just write all over them. Yeah, you can. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll call that good for tonight. And uh, thank you all for playing along. Uh, next week, I will have a series of envelopes with a letter of the alphabet and whatever number is in that letter. And it does, it's not necessarily going to go in order. It's like A won't necessarily be less than one. It could be less than 26. Who knows? But the so whatever letter you pick, you get the number that's in that, and we'll take then the lessons in order. Right. So you just figure out, okay, what are the 10 most significant lessons? Right. What are the so you just take a look at the ones that seem to be the key lessons? Because some of them are um, fine-tuning type things, but some of them are very significant. And you're, those are probably the lessons that you, you'll you have an opportunity to, to draw. And we will trust that God in his providence will guide the whole process. And he will give you the strength and the ability to do it just how it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. 
and your presentation is going to be, you're sitting in front of a group of people, you're like working with a small group who are unfamiliar with the material. So you're gonna convey the information about the upcoming lesson. That's the one you're gonna give me. So let's say it was lesson 26. So you're gonna take 10 minutes or so and you're going to say, okay, in lesson 26, these are the key things to be attentive to, to be on the lookout for, to be aware of, to be prepared for. These are key points in the lesson that's important for you to be able to lay hold of. Give them kind of a foretaste. Um, you know how like uh, they have a movie trailer type thing for a new movie coming out, right? Well, it was kind of like that. They can, they can do it in two minutes and tell you what a two hour movie is gonna be, right? You don't have to be that good, but that's basically the idea. Just give the, the snapshot of what, what's coming. And then as they get into the lesson, everything get all, all the, the details that they get mapped out. So um, anyway, so uh, let's see. Sharon, would you pray us out tonight, please?